Welcome to episode number three of the DM's Guide to the Tomb of the Nine Gods. Thank you again for the good support. Let's begin. Our party has just arrived in the Tomb of the Nine Gods. We have opened the entrance and we've made our steps in. When your characters arrive in the Tomb of the Nine Gods, they place in puzzle cubes. You then have your first trap and they either pull the lever and trigger the trap, as we said before, or they don't touch the lever. Trap is not triggered and this door slowly rises. Once your characters enter the tomb, you have a countdown, so you have exactly one hour before both of these doors will shut. Your characters can prevent these doors from shutting by jamming iron spikes into the door seams. That's one option. Or they simply could leave the tomb, correct the puzzle cubes, and come back. That's one option. Just remember, when they come in, these doors will slowly begin to close. Right now, I'm going to talk about area five, which is this part here, this part here, and this part here. So area five. This is what I think is probably the most Indiana Jones-esque trap in the tomb. A moss-covered corridor extends beyond the second door, tree roots hang from the sagging ceiling, and the air reeks of rotten damp. Ahead is a base relief carving of a bearded devil's face, adorning the wall at a T-shaped intersection. The devil's open mouth is well of utter darkness. So the main thing with this tomb is, the ceilings are 8 foot tall, and eight foot halls and corridors and in rooms, unless stated otherwise, it's 12 foot tall. So it's very, very snug. Each X on the map marks a five foot square pressure plate triggered by 20 points or more. And when you step in this plate, it will fire four poison darts. Each dart makes a ranged attack against a random target within 10 feet of the placer plate. Moss obscures the tiny holes in the walls through which the darts are fired. They can be spotted with a successful DC 15 perception check. If anyone investigates the walls, they can make a perception check. And if they investigate the floor, they can make a perception check as well. A character notes irregular regalities in the floor's tile patterns that reveal the pressure plates. And if you look at the walls, moss obscures the tiny holes. If you look through, you can see there's a chamber of some sort. So we're going to look at this room through a different perspective. So this is the doorway here. And your characters arrive from this side and they'll exit this side. So we're going to draw a small man for scale, and if they step in these pressure plates, the arrows will fire. So let's talk about the base relief carving of a bearded devil's face that adorns the wall at the T-shaped intersection. This is the base relief carving, and inside you have magical darkness and a permanent silent spell fills the mouth of the devil's face and a large cavity behind it. The face is sculpted from stone and milled seamlessly within the surrounding wall. The mouth is wide enough for a medium or smaller creature to crawl through. If a character casts Detect Magic, or similar effect, reveals an aura of illusion magic over the face. What is inside this then? So, it's completely dark and it's completely silent. And inside it, ho it is the home to a Shadow Demon. So, Shadow Demon. What is a Shadow Demon and why are these guys important? When a demon's body is destroyed but the fiend is prevented from reforming the abyss, its essence takes on a vague physical form. These shadow demons exist outside normal abyssal hierarchy, since their creation results in most often from mortal magic. So let's see how dangerous this shadow demon is then. Low armor class, hit point 66, quite high. He has incredibly low strength. <laughs> Everything else is pretty average. His main skills is stealthy, he's vulnerable to radiant damage. He's able to hide in darkness, which is perfect because he's inside pitch black. So one thing to note is the shadow demon can see within this magical darkness. And if any creature reaches inside the mouth, the demon makes an attack with advantage. And because of this advantage, if the demon had advantage on his attack roll, it gains extra psychic damage as well. Good to know. It does double damage. So it'd be heavy hitter, so this character will be used kind of to surprise your players. So he has 66 hit points. So it says in the book that if the darkness is dispelled, the shadow demon emerges and attacks until reduced to his half his hit points. You have this shadow demon be a recurrent character in your campaign, so the character puts his hand in to see what's in the side here. The characters might assume there might be treasure, or might be something important here. He comes in surprised as an attack, they attack back, and he just flees, and then he can constantly harass your players throughout the level. So yeah, it's where he has incorp incorporeal movement, which means he can move through creatures, so he can run away if there's, let's say, that your characters are surrounded. So if this area is blocked by your characters, he simply can fly directly right through them. It's perfect for hit and run tactics. And also, since he is fairly intelligent, he does not want to die. So that is Shadow Demon, and that is 5B. So now let's talk about 5C. So a rusted iron grate is set into the corridor floor. Through its bars, you see muddy water flowing past. So the bars cannot be bent or broken, but there's space enough that a small creature can squeeze through, such you've got a gnomes or a halfling. The grate can also be lifted by one or more creatures with a strength score of 24. Any creature that passes through this hatch drops into the sluggish underground river that flows towards area 17. 
This is one thing you would look into. It might not happen, but it can make this very, very interesting. So the river is flowing this way. So it's flowing towards the north. You have two areas upstream, so here and here. But as you follow this river down, you end up at area 17. So area 17 is open to level five. So your characters go straight down there. You might end up fighting the Abolith very, very early on in the game. That's one thing to watch out for. So we've discussed area five, so let's continue away. So in the book, it goes on to area six. With this video, I'm going to explain the halls. The reason I'm doing this is because if I follow six, six goes straight into the trickster god's tomb, Obalaka. Next video, I'm going to go Obalaka's tomb there, and then I'm going to go over Moa's tomb here, and then I'm going to go over Wongo's tomb right here. The book is a fantastic module, however, it does get quite confusing if you follow it linearly, as in this will directly go into 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain all the hallways, and then once I finish the floors, I'll then go into the tomb separately, just so it's a bit more sense to you. But before I forget, I'll explain what number six looks like. So number six, number six is the crystal window. A creepers and vines cling to the walls of this corridor, at the end of which is an arched crystal window, six feet wide and ten feet high. Through it you can see a dark chamber. This dark chamber is Oblaka's tomb in area 10. So this crystal window peers into Oblaka's tomb, can it be opened, Blocks all sound between areas 6 and 10, which is really important. Has an AC of 15, damage threshold of 15, and 10 hit points. And because it's an object, it's immune to poison the psychic damage. If any of your characters look through this window, they'll see the description on area 10. I'll explain that in the next episode, but remember, it is here, I'm now just going to explain the halls. Let's look at the right of the hallway, and that will be number 7. Number 7 is the Grand Staircase. A grand chamber opens ahead, 50 feet across, and plunging down into darkness below. A stone balcony winds along the walls to connect four archways. Other balcony levels are visible below, with corridors radiating off in all directions. To the north, a stone staircase descends to the lower levels. Right away, your characters have access to level 1. They then have level 2, level 3, and finally, right at the bottom, this is level 4. It's actually very, very high up. That falls approximately 110 feet to the bottom. So just in case you don't know of any characters, for instance, get pushed off by a tomb dwarf or a tomb guardian. Over here, you have Simone, and this is one of the things I like about this level, is there's a lot about foreshadowing. So if your characters walk around, you see we are not alone. A hunch figure glares up at you from the balcony below. Wearing a mask, that is a replica of a devil's face at the tomb entrance. Without saying the word, the figure steps out of sight. So they'll see this figure right here. So as I said in the previous episode, this is the Tomb Dwarf, so he has the statistics of a right. If your characters are very, very fast, if they see this Tomb Dwarf there, they could run down and potentially catch him. However, in the tomb, since there's a number of traps and weathers and the Tomb Dwarfs have to repair everything, there's a number of secret doors where they can walk through. So on this level here, you can see there's secret door here, secret door there, secret door here, secret door here. Your characters can find these secret doors, but they need to have a massively high pass perception. So I was talking about secret doors. Most secret doors within the tomb slide open on stone runners. A secret door can be spotted by any character within five feet of it who has a pass perception score of 20 or higher, or with a search on a successful DC 20 perception check. The reason why this is important is because if your characters look for the tomb dwarf and they rush down, but not quick enough, it appears it vanished into thin air. The reason of this is because it has a secret door to area 25. Since we are dealing with a three-dimensional map, the floor below, so about 25 feet below here, on level two, is a secret door that will lead you to where there's workstation. So your characters will peer over here, look down, and then if they're quick enough and catch the Toon Dwarf, who won't say a word, he won't give you any information where things are being built, or where they're constructing new tomb dwarves and no tomb guardians. So let's say your characters have walked around. One of the main things with Area 7 is that they have access to Floor 1 to Floor 5 now. So they can go down. One thing I would definitely recommend if you're running this campaign is you need to read the entirety of the tomb briefly, have a, have a good understanding of what it looks like. And one of my advice as a DM is, if your players go somewhere which you've not fully prepared for, organize a brief break or simply end your session and come back after you've done more prep because you don't want your characters to wait 
Well, you don't want them to sit on the table and waiting for you to improv something that potentially might affect the rest of the game. So my advice is, if in doubt, have a break, a cup of tea, or simply start the session later on, maybe the next week or so. But for Area 7, make sure you prepare to know exactly, well, not exactly, I would say briefly know what's on each level. So you've got an idea of what you're coming up with. And if you don't know exactly, stop the session and do some more research. We're now going to come down this corridor and we're now going to go to Area 8. Magical attraction. A rusting statue of a knight stands at the west end of this hall. Gripping a large iron shield, shards and flakes of rusted metal cover the floor around the statue's feet. A magical field around the statue attracts metal objects of any kind, not just ferrous metal. Any magical object that comes into direct contact with the shield disintegrates, sharing the floor with powdered rust. Artifacts are immune to this corrosion. I would say the room begins here, so the instant your characters get to this point here, the effects will take place. What happens when they walk in there? Any creature wearing or carrying metal items that enters the room or starts to turn there feels the pull of the statue and must succeed in a DC 10 strength athletics check to resist it. On a failed check, the character loses a footing and flies across the chamber and slams into the statue. So it takes 1d6 bludgeon damage for every 10 feet, so that's 10 feet. So if your character walks in here, so that is... 90 feet. So that'll be 96 worth of damage flying across and then anything that's metal will disintegrate. And if your character is wearing metal armour, it does this check with his advantage. The main thing to look into with this is that it has to touch the metal directly. So if let's say that you have a metal object inside the backpack, it will not be affected. So how do you destroy it? The way you can overcome this is the statue and shield are treated as a single large object with armour class of 17 and 40 hit points, and they're immune to piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing from non-magical attacks, and because they're an object, they are immune to poison and psychic damage. If this is destroyed, it will be immune, like, it won't work anymore. So the best way of destroying this, personally, would be by casting a spell. So at a distance, since, for instance, let's say it's making a constitution saving throw, or like a dexterity saving throw, I can't run away, so you can blow up from a distance. And I would also say that if you're firing arrows at it, it will automatically hit because it is attracting metal as well. So we throw a metal object as well, that's the way I would roll it. Or you can simply cast Spell Magic, DC 17, and it will shut down the magic field for one hour. So what is here? What is number nine? So number nine, Magic Fountain. A large fountain crusted with moss rises in the middle of a circular room. Three marble maidens stand in the fountain, holding pictures out of which water flows. Now in the game, we have advice from the spirits. So since it's not linear, your characters could go to Obalaka or Wongo's uh, tomb, which are located here. So that's Obalaka there, and Wongo is here. If they get possessed by a trickster god, which I'll explain in the next video, they will get some advice. So their advice for this is, Cautious Obalaka advises against anyone drinking from this fountain. Reckless Wongo encourages the host to drink from the fountain. If your characters follow these, uh, these flaws, they'll be re rewarded at the end of the tomb which I'll explain later on. And if I don't remember it, remember to post in the comment and give me a really angry message about it, okay. So Magic Fountain, any creature that drinks from the fountain experiences a random magical effect, determined by rolling a d4 and consulting the Magic Fountain effects table. Water removed from this fountain stored in a container regains its magical properties, and a different effect occurs each time someone drinks from the container. Under the scrutiny of a deck magic spell, under the scrutiny of a detect magic spell or similar effect, the fountain radiates an aura of transmutation magic. What is easy for? What effects can happen? The creature drinking the water must make a DC 12 constitution saving throw, or they take 8d10 necrotic damage or half damage on a successful one. If this damage re reduces the creature's hit points to zero, it dies and turns to dust. So your characters could potentially die in this room. As in, you can have your first player death by drinking in here. Number two, the creature drinking the water loses the ability to speak for eight hours. Speaking is important because if you're a spellcaster, you need to speak to cast majority of your spells with your variable component. However, less restoration will fix this. This is the fun one. Number three, the creature drinking the water magically changes sex. A greater restoration spell restores the creature's original sex as it does another drink from the fountain that yields the same result. We're changing gender here. This is something you might want to talk with your players for, as in some people might not be comfortable role-playing a character of a different gender. My personal opinion, I think I would keep this, I kept this in, because I thought this would be quite amusing, as in my characters did drink from this, and luckily enough, one person did get affected by number one, but no one died as of yet. 
And then finally, the creature could drink in the water gains 2d10 temporary hit points. Risky business, but that's what makes this very, very interesting. So you've got a choice here. In short, does damage, will kill you, will stop you from speaking, will change your gender, and yeah, we'll give you some temporary hit points. So ladies and gents, that is my episode finished for the day. Thanks very much for watching. And next episode, I'm going to discuss in detail the Shrines of the Church Gods on level one. So we're going to look at Obalaka, Wongo, and Moa. Again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ciao.